Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight. We're absolutely seeing the highest surge in cases from across the entire pandemic. Infectious disease doctors share the latest on Omicron amid the recent COVID surge. Headaches for holiday travelers as thousands of flights are canceled. How the industry is weathering yet another COVID spike. We know some student loan borrowers are still coping with the pandemic and need some time before resuming payments. President Biden extends a freeze on federal student loan payments. Well, we didn't get a white Christmas, but is snow in this week's forecast? To envision my father before he was a father gives him more dimension. This image a local woman sees a new image of her father through his long lost street photography. In the studio and at the museum with artist Tony Fitzpatrick and artworks that blend nature with urban grit. David's brought Jeffrey, one Jeffrey? of the reptiles. Is this Jeffrey? And remembering longtime director of Lincoln Park Zoo, Dr. Lester Fisher, who died last week at 100 years old. But first, some of today's top stories. COVID cases in Illinois are still surging. The state records just under 10,000 new COVID-19 cases and 17 deaths in the last 24 hours, as the test positivity rate now stands at 11.7%. The state is averaging around 14,500 new cases per day over the last week and has seen a spike in hospitalizations with 14 percent ICU capacity. Governor J.B. Pritzker and top health official Dr. Ngozi Azike say the surging Omicron variant has caused them to step up state efforts to get people vaccinated and boosted. To get more shots in arms, we are coordinating with local health departments, expanding capacity by assisting them with surge staffing to help administer the vaccinations. Meanwhile, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announces a shortened quarantine period for those that get COVID. The CDC recommends anyone with COVID to isolate for five days instead of 10, but that is if they are displaying no symptoms. The CDC then recommends masking up around other people for five days after that quarantine period. And we'll have more on the CDC's recommendation change later in the program. Chicago Public School officials are urging students, families and staff to get tested for COVID before coming back to class from winter break. The district sent a message to parents over the weekend asking students to test before returning to school on January 3rd. CPS also says it is expanding drop-off locations for COVID test kits sent out earlier this month. Families can return those test kits to six public library branches between noon and 5 tomorrow. And they're Englewood, South Shore, Auburn Gresham, also the Southeast Side, Austin, and Altgeld Gardens. Test kits can also be returned to a FedEx facility. And the city announces New Year's Eve fireworks at Navy Pier will go on as scheduled despite the Omicron surge. Mayor Lightfoot says the display will be visible along the lakefront and Chicago River and urges Chicagoans to safely congregate outside or watch the show on TV. The fireworks were canceled last year due to COVID. And up next, a check-in with two infectious disease doctors as COVID cases spike. So stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. U.S. health officials are shortening the recommended time for COVID isolation and quarantine. The CDC now calls for anyone with COVID to isolate for five days instead of 10. That is, if they don't have symptoms and CDC additionally recommends wearing a mask for five days after that quarantine period. CDC is also similarly shortening the time that close contacts need to quarantine. This all comes as COVID cases surge across the country. Joining us with more are Dr. John Segretti, Medical Director of Infection Control and Prevention at Rush University Medical Center, and Dr. Rachel Rubin, Senior Medical Officer and Co-Lead at Cook County Department of Public Health. Doctors, welcome back, both of you, and thanks for joining us. Dr. Segretti, let's start with you, please. Give us a sense, okay. if you would, of what hospitalizations are currently like at Rush. <clears throat> the number of uh, people admitted with COVID is definitely going up and uh, it has been for the last 
two weeks or so. And we're seeing more people in the intensive care unit. And what's interesting is that while we're seeing a fair number of vaccinated people being admitted, very few of the people in the intensive care unit have been vaccinated uh, or boosted. So uh, it does seem like people who are the most severely ill are the ones who are not vaccinated and not boosted. And doctor, are you expecting to see uh, a rise in hospitalizations uh, after you know this past weekend's holiday gatherings? Well, I think that that's something that we've seen in the past, and I expect that we'll see some uh, uptick in number of cases. How much? No one knows, but I suspect that we'll see more cases on top of the the surge that we're going uh, that we're experiencing already. Dr. Rubin, would you say Omicron is the leading variant in the majority of cases right now, or is Delta still leading the way? From what we can tell based on the statistics uh, from the CDC, it looks like that the new cases that we are seeing now are predominantly uh, Omicron. In terms of what we've been able to document in the state of Illinois, and especially in the Chicago area, we don't really quite know yet. This is certainly what we suspect, but because only a very small percentage of the positive cases, the specimens are genotyped for the type of virus uh, that individuals are being infected with, we don't really know yet. But we certainly know that if uh, Omicron is not the predominant variant in our area, it will be very shortly. Dr. Segretti, how would you describe the, the impact of the ongoing staff shortage right now, especially as we're seeing healthcare workers themselves uh, being infected with amid this surge? Yeah, I think the big difference with this surge compared to surges we've had in the past is that in the past we had plenty of, uh, we had a shortage of resources because there were so many patients. This time, it, even though we're not seeing as many patients as we did in March and April of 2020, we've got fewer staff. And uh, so it really has been uh, very challenging because of the uh, number of people, the number of staff that have gotten sick. Now, as we mentioned, the U.S. Centers for uh, Disease Control and Prevention just updating the guidelines that people who test positive can exit isolation after five days um, if they don't have symptoms and if they continue to wear a mask for five days post-quarantine. Uh, Dr. Rubin, what is Cook County currently recommending for people who test positive? At this point, um, we haven't announced whether we will uh, be in sync with the latest CDC uh, guidance, um, though we usually are in lockstep with them. But we need to wait and see what the Illinois Department of Public Health uh, puts out for their guidance for the local health departments in our area. Okay, so uh, it sounds like the guidance not decided yet, obviously, and I'm sure we'll be hearing from you know those departments uh, going forward. But what do we know about the Omicron variant, Dr. Rubin, that might support this new guideline and, and what it what this new guideline could be based on? Well, the guidelines, um, I think, are, are based on the science as we know it up to now, which is that especially with Omicron, that it's highly contagious, you can get it quicker. Doesn't, you don't have to be exposed to somebody for quite as long before you get it. Also, for those individuals that have been vaccinated, individuals tend to get very mild and maybe even asymptomatic cases of it. We tend to, it's also been shown that when somebody is symptomatic means that they probably have what's called a higher viral load and they're more likely to be contagious and infect somebody else that they may come in contact with. But if they have no symptoms at all, waiting that five day period, but remember it's not just five days of isolation they're recommending, it's also an additional five days where that individual wears a mask at all times when they're outside of their home. So putting those two things together most likely will keep individuals safe. And in terms of the quarantine period, that again means that if you are not vaccinated, it's recommended that you maintain that quarantine for 10 days, if at all possible. And if it's not possible, again, you have to be very strict with your mask wearing. And if you've been vaccinated, 
and you're a close contact, but have no symptoms. So therefore you don't seem to have an active case of COVID. You're also likely not going to be infecting somebody else. Now, um, Dr. Segretti, South Africa and the UK, we know that they were hit uh, by the Omicron wave before the US. They have begun to report that their hospitalization rates um, have started to hit their peak. At what point do we think the same could happen in the US um, or are we expecting uh, the situation to worsen in January? Well, if the past is any predictor of the future, what we've generally seen is that as the, the number of cases goes up and then one to two to three weeks later, number of hospitalizations and deaths start to go up. Again, the, 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 the uh, uh, rate at which hospitalizations and death have gone up in those countries hasn't been nearly as steep as the rate of cases. So we're hopeful that we're not going to see an overwhelming number of people who end up in the hospital or end up dying. But I do think that we'll see a lot more people get infected probably through January. Dr. Rubin, what practices do you advise uh, for people as we approach the, the weekend New Year's celebrations? Well, as uh, you're aware, um, we, as well as the city of Chicago, my health department covers the majority of the suburbs, is that we've put out a new mitigation order that won't go into effect until after New Year's. That being said, anything that's in that order is very important for individuals to, to make the right choices. And so what that means is we are not recommending that people congregate in large settings with large numbers of people, especially with its unrelated people outside of your own household where you're not sure of anybody's vaccination status. So we're recommending not to have large New Year's Eve celebrations, even though they are not going to be mandated as being prohibited. Um, so that's one thing for sure. Always wear your mask, especially when you're with people who are you're not unsure whether they're vaccinated and they're not part of your household. Wash your hands, try to maintain that physical distance of at least six feet or more. And these are all things we've been saying all along, especially since the summer when we have had an indoor masking order that everybody indoors needs to mask whether they are vaccinated or not. The problem is, is that when you have a large gathering and people are eating or drinking and they are Dancing sure potentially, people that's began to, a real issue. They begin to forget, of course. Uh, we'll have to leave it there. Um, and best of luck. And of course, Happy New Year to Dr. John Zagretti and Dr. Rachel Rubin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Brandis. Holiday travel is turning out to be a nightmare for many would-be flyers as the Omicron COVID variant surge triggers the cancellation of thousands of flights. As of this afternoon, the flight data website FlightAware reports more than 1,100 cancellations for flights within, to, or from the U.S., and that's after more than 3,000 cancellations over the weekend. Is there an end to the holiday travel chaos in sight, and how well can the industry weather the latest COVID surge? Joining us are Henry Hardevel, the travel industry analyst and the president of Atmosphere Research Group, which analyzes market trends in the global travel industry, and Captain Dennis Tager, an American Airlines pilot and a spokesman for the Allied Pilots Association. Welcome both of you to uh, Chicago tonight. Dennis Tager, we see demand near pre-pandemic levels, but all kinds of cancellations and delays this weekend. What's behind the hiccup? Well, yes, demand is here. Uh, the American uh, public has proven that over the summer and now. Um, what's happening here is our, our calls that we've seen uh, during the summer and over Halloween, and that is uh, some weather hit, but most importantly, this, this COVID uh, flare-up has hit, so it's causing some strain on the operation. Um, seeing these cancellations is not uh, surprising, but it's the recovery we're watching for, and American has been uniquely challenged in recovering from these events. So, Henry Hart of it, when we say the operations here, does that mean that crews are going down with COVID and there really is no backup? Correct. I mean, look, the COVID, uh, the Omicron variant of COVID, it hits people randomly, even people who are fully vaccinated and have gotten a booster shot. Uh, and so uh, airline employees don't have a special sign over their head saying, I work for an airline, don't hit me Omicron. They're just as vulnerable as everybody else. And while airlines do have reserve crews, there are only so many people who are working and uh, airlines can't control who gets sick and who doesn't. So Dennis Tager, in terms of airlines, was this 
inevitable or could it have been avoided? Uh, well, the infection rate is nothing that anyone can control. But how well and how quickly they, these airlines recover, and let's not forget United and Delta, JetBlue are all going through the same thing. Um, but we're going to see now we actually have something uh, that's not localized to an area. It's across the system. So which airline is able to recover the, the quickest and most effectively to take care of their passengers? Uh, the race is on. And, um, you know, we're going to beat this COVID thing. But most importantly, we want to get our people from A to B today. So, Henry Harderfeld, which airline might be the first to emerge uh, without these cancellations? And how long do you think this disruption is going to last? That's a good question to ask, and it's not one I can answer because we just don't know where Omicron is going to, to hit. Uh, it seems that United and Delta were hit with uh, more out and more crews who are sick before American. If the trend continues, it's possible, but I'm not saying it's guaranteed, that United and Delta may emerge from this ahead of American. But we just don't know. This virus is random, uh, and it could just affect people uh, at any airline at any time. It, it, Dennis Tager, there's been debate uh, for the last year or so about whether the FAA should uh, mandate vaccination for all tra air travelers. President Biden most recently said he didn't think it was necessary quite yet. Do you think there'll come a point where it might be necessary? Well, we're going to let the science drive this, the scientists. Um, what we do know is that it's safe to be on an airplane. Um, the airflow, the filtration, uh, the HEPA filters, it's higher quality than in a surgical room. And we've proven that during COVID. So ironically, when I'm out on a trip, um, sometimes I want to get to the airplane quickly because I know in that contained area with the airflow on it, I'm, I'm, I'm in the safest place possible. It's the ride from the hotel to the airport on that van that I get concerned about. So uh, um, we'll let the scientists figure this out and the vaccination. Um, we don't want that to be used as leverage to inspire people to get Vax, though. Uh, the airplane is safe, so we just want to trust the science, go with it, and uh, we don't want to be caught up in this uh, leverage campaign. I'm personally vaccinated and boosted. I believe in it, but, um, you know, we've got 88% of our pilots vaccinated and working through exemptions on the others, so we're going to get through this, but we want to make sure that there aren't rash decisions made with a what we call in the cockpit a rush to comply. And, and Henry Harteveld, speaking of compliance, and most major carriers did require vaccination for workers, crew, pilots, although much of that doesn't take effect until the new year. How is that going? Well, it seems to be going well. You just heard from Dennis that 88% of the American Airlines pilots are vaccinated. Uh, United and uh, Delta, Southwest and other airlines, I believe, have similarly high numbers or maybe higher. And look, if we didn't have as many airline employees vaccinated, as we do now, it's possible these cancellations could be far greater in number and the number of people who were affected by these cancellations much, much larger. And Dennis, is that what you're seeing from your end uh, with the union that uh, many crew members, pilots are choosing to be vaccinated or are there some holdouts uh, that are losing their jobs over it? Uh, well, no one's going to lose their job on January 4th when the deadline is. That's just the time to revisit that. And uh, most of our pilots had, like I said, 88%. And then there are some who can't get the vaccination due to medical reasons or have applied for religious exemption. So it looks like we're going to get through this. Uh, we'll find out on January 4th. But that's not the drop dead date. That is just the time to, con and pilots will be able to continue to work while they work through the final moments of this. But I want to point out that for the, the coded um, reasons for why American was canceling these flights, we're able to see those. And 85 to 90 percent of them are attributed to not being able to connect the pilot to the airplane. So we're watching that closely. We've watched American in the weather recovery struggle connecting pilots. So we want to see where the correlation is on this because I know we can do better. And that's what we're trying to do with management as soon as they sit down and talk with us. So, so you're saying may, maybe it requires smoother uh, operations at higher levels with American. Uh, uh, Henry Hardeveld, as we mentioned at the top, the demand is certainly back. As uh, Dennis said, Americans want to travel. Uh, are airlines uh, recovering from the major financial losses and, and able to turn a profit? Yeah, so so far this year, the airlines have managed pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, not all airlines are, are handling this equally well, but most airlines are doing well. And there was optimism going into Christmas that for several carriers, they would be profitable. Uh, certainly, the losses are much lower now than they were during 2020. And there's great hope that in 2022, we see a meaningful resumption of business travel, and we should be on a good trajectory for airlines to return to a more normal pace of business, at least as far as revenues and profits 
are concerned. All right, we'll see how this uh, gets ironed out over the next uh, several weeks. And our thanks to Henry Hardeveld and Dennis Tager. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And up next, seeing a parent from another angle. So stay with us. I come from a people that not only found a way to survive through the most horrific circumstances, but they thrived. I could not save one of the boys of color in my own life. If my family could be exposed to this horror, then really it could happen to anyone. We are truly all in this together. And there's much more ahead on the program, including an update on paused student loan payments. But first, photos have the power to transport us through time, taking us back to the places and people we ache to see again, especially when the photos are of a loved one lost long ago. Local television producer and writer Joan Tortorici Ruppert lost her father as a young child. But through a collection of rediscovered photo negatives, she's getting to know who he was before he was her father and getting a glimpse into Chicago history as well. Producer Erica Gunderson has the story. This one is my dad too. Who took it, I have no idea. Mm. But I know this is pre-war because he didn't have all the shrapnel scars on his belly. Joan Tortorici Rupert barely had time to know her father before his sudden death in 1963. He was 43 years old and she was just eight. I remember that he was very tall and very broad, and I was little. It never dawned on me as a little kid that he was so incredibly young when he died. Joe Tortorici never got to grow old, but nearly 60 years after he died, his youngest daughter has watched him grow young through the photos he took in 1930s Chicago. He wasn't the guy who always had a camera in his hand. So that's one of the reasons why I was so surprised when my mom handed me the shoebox and said, oh, your dad was a very avid photographer. Rupert's mother, Nancy, presented her with a shoebox full of photo negatives in the late 90s after Rupert mentioned she was taking a darkroom class. At that point, Rupert had only basic knowledge of how to process photo negatives, so the negative sat in a closet for more than two decades. Rupert says she finally felt ready to tackle the project in early 2020. And then... Well, COVID hit and a lot of us had a lot of time on our hands. So I was able to just completely immerse myself in the research and trial and error of getting as much detail out of the negatives. And the internet helped me learn how to do that. Basically, you create a white space, set your smartphone to invert colors, and then instantly your negatives become positives. Soon, Rupert was watching a new image of her father develop right before her eyes. Hanging out with friends, being at the schoolyard, mugging for the camera, posing with cool cars that you likely don't own. They did goofy things. They climbed up on billboards. You mean my dad was a teenager? He went to high school? He had friends? He had blonde girlfriends who weren't my mom? And things like that that really surprised me that intellectually I knew he had a, a youth, but to actually see it for the first time was really amazing. Rupert recognized some of the people in the pictures as family. But even when she didn't recognize the photo subjects, Rupert says the quality of the photos drew her in. I would put something up on the scanner and my heart would just be beating out of my chest because I'm thinking, this is a really good picture. And then there'd be another one. The photos stopped around 1943 when Tortorici left for naval duty in World War II. Rupert thought that was the extent of the collection until her older sister unearthed a second batch. In this second batch were pictures of us as tiny little kids, uh, the empty lot in the suburbs where our house was going to be. So I saw him go from a child to a man with the gap in the middle of the war years. And that to me was very telling. While Tortorici was rigorously in his own photos, his work extravagantly captured the character of the then deeply Italian Near West Side. 
Rupert created a website featuring a selection of the photos and turned to Chicago history social media groups for help identifying the places in them. One such location was Crane Tech High School, which Facebookers recognized thanks to its massive sconces. We joined Rupert on her first visit ever to her father's alma mater, where she says she was delighted to learn he was a member of the camera club. Yes, he learned his craft here. If your dad came swinging out of those doors right now, what would you say to him? What would you want to ask him? I would want to tell him that I see him. I'm very glad he kept the negatives, but first I would tell him thanks. For Chicago Tonight, this is Erica Gunderson. Rupert calls the collection the shoebox negatives, and she says she welcomes any information on the people and places in the photos. You'll find more information about that on our website. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, snow is in this week's forecast, possibly ending this year's near record long stretch without any flakes. President Biden extends the pause on repaying federal student loans until May 1st, but some are calling on him to go even further. In the studio and at the museum with artist Tony Fitzpatrick and artworks that blend nature with urban grit. And a familiar face to many Chicagoans, we remember the late Dr. Lester Fisher and his time at Lincoln Park Zoo. But first, some more of today's top stories. As the Omicron COVID variant surges across the state, the governor's office says it's doing more to support community health departments get more people vaccinated and tested. Right now, we're absolutely seeing the highest surge in cases from across the entire pandemic for the last two years. We had over 21,000 new cases reported from December 24th. It's the highest for the entire pandemic. But it's not just about cases. If it was just cases and no one was ending up in the hospital, then let the cases be. State Public Health Director Dr. Ngazi Azike says the number of COVID hospital cases increased by a net of 330 people in the last 24 hours. The State Health Department and Governor Pritzker's office say they're doubling personnel at regional sites to help administer vaccines, as well as increasing the number of operating days at community-based testing sites up to six days a week. The state's current test positivity rate is 11.7%. Activists are demanding more information on why a 33-year-old woman died while in police custody more than a week ago. Family and friends say military veteran Irene Chavez was found hung to death in the 3rd District Chicago Police Station near the Greater Grand Crossing community. Speaking to reporters outside the station, they say the black and Latino queer woman was arrested for an alleged misdemeanor at Jeffrey Pub on December 18th. But... Chavez's sister, Iris, says despite efforts to get answers from the police department, she still has many questions. And because I have to speculate like this is why I am here. I have to get answers. I have to get someone to speak to me without a redacted report that I got at the Chicago headquarters. No information, no narrative, no nothing. I need something from someone. And the fifth Chicago Blackhawks game has been postponed for COVID-related reasons. The NHL says Wednesday night's game against the Winnipeg Jets in Manitoba will be rescheduled. Four other games have already been postponed in the last two weeks, including tomorrow night's game against Columbus. NHL's commissioner says the league will use the February 6th through 22nd window to reschedule games since players will not be competing in the Beijing Winter Olympics, also due to increasing COVID cases. And now, Paris, back to you. All right, thanks very much, Brandis. Christmas has come and gone without any flakes of snow. In fact, it has been 287 days without measurable snowfall in Chicago. The city is three days out from the no snow record of 290 days set back in 2012. But this week's forecast has a different plan with a call for wet snow and then a chance of light snow on Wednesday, one to three inches of accumulation possible tomorrow. And joining us is Lee Carlaw, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service in Chicago. Lee Carlaw, thanks for being here uh, with us. So tell us how rare it is to go this long without a flake of snow. 
Yeah, obviously you hit the nail on the head there with that record that you mentioned. Uh, it's uh, going on since 2012 was the last time uh, that we hadn't seen flakes, uh, you know, at this point in the season. And uh, basically every day since December 20th, we've been sort of adding to that new record. So as you mentioned, 287 days since the, uh, the last uh, measurable snowfall at the Chicago uh, climate site there in O'Hare. And, and I will say that's not to say we haven't seen snow so far this year. In fact, uh, O'Hare itself, the climate site for Chicago, um, has recorded snow on about a dozen days so far this winter. It's just that either it hasn't fallen heavy enough to accumulate or the snow showers have kind of danced around uh, the airport. Um, we actually down here in Romeoville, about 20 miles southwest of uh, the uh, O'Hare airport there, uh, did pick up about half an inch of snow earlier in November, but um, still have yet to see the first measurable snowfall there at uh, the measuring site there at right. uh, O'Hare International. So to end this drought, we need a measurable snowfall, as you say, so define measurable snowfall. <laughs> Yeah, so in terms of the, the terminology, that's a tenth of an inch or more. So basically, anytime you see uh, flakes flying, but they don't accumulate up to a tenth of an inch, uh, that is uh, termed uh, non-measurable snowfall, even though you may be seeing the flakes flying in the air. So that's sort of the, the, the main number we're looking for, um, for tomorrow at least, when a snowfall is back in the forecast. I see. So Romeoville has broken its own drought, but not so with Chicago. And there is snow in the forecast for the region. What can we expect tomorrow and Wednesday? Yeah, so uh, first, uh, you know, decent looking shot at accumulating snow for tomorrow. Looks like snow at, at this point probably going to break out late in the morning, early afternoon across the area. Winter weather advisory is in effect for areas uh, along and north of I-80, um, mainly because this is the first uh, uh, accumulating snowfall for a widespread portion of the uh, of the area here. Looking at about one to three inches of snow, mainly on elevated and grassy surfaces, but it may come down heavy enough early in the afternoon that it starts to stick to pavement. I anticipate lots of local news coverage of this tomorrow, even though it's a relatively moderate snowfall event for Chicago standards. So what is driving this milder, drier winter so far? Yeah, believe it or not, um, it will, will trend this back to La Nina. You may have heard about this uh, referenced in the news recently. And um, all that is basically is a uh, strengthening of the trade winds across the equatorial Pacific. And what that does is ends up uh, driving thunderstorm activity farther west. So if you were to pull up a satellite map right now, you'd actually see lots of thunderstorms ongoing across Indonesia. And you think, well, that doesn't make any sense why that might be impacting our weather here. But um, over the course of a day or a week, it doesn't really matter all that much. But when you have so many thunderstorms ongoing over the course of a season, uh, the atmospheric uh, energy budget has to change. And so the way that it does that is a large area of high pressure has been built off to our west across the Pacific, and it's sent the polar jet stream well north um, into Canada. And we've just found ourselves on the warm side of that jet stream uh, for the better part of the last two months. So thunderstorms in Indonesia impacting our winter here in Chicago. So interesting. So what does that portend for the rest of the winter then? So just looking over the near term over the next one to two weeks, it does look like we're going to trend towards a stormier and somewhat more active and possibly colder uh, spell as we head into January, certainly sort of the heart of our winter season here. Um, and so thus far, we've had a stormy pattern. We just haven't had the cold air. Uh, so it does look like that may be changing over the next several weeks um, and into uh, into next year. So uh, to put things in perspective as well, 20, uh, our last uh, winter season, 2020 into 2021, that was also a La Nina year. And this time we were also talking about a very limited amount of snow. But I'm sure many Chicagoans <laughs> remember that we entered into that year with quite a bit of snow in January and February, um, totaled about 46 inches for the season, all in those basically two months there. We got blasted in those months. I'll never forget how high that snow piled up. So are you saying that over the next few months, the same thing could happen again? Not saying that's all set in stone, but uh, certainly we can see how weather can change on a dime here. Just uh, we need that right overlap of the active storm track and cold air kind of bleeding out of uh, Canada here. And it does look like we may have some chances for that over the coming weeks. And you mentioned La Nina. I mean, this is, we've had El Nino, La Nina, naturally occurring systems. To what extent is climate change playing a role in this as well? So I'll preface this all by saying that it's, it's difficult, really impossible to connect an individual storm system or even a seasonal storm track to climate change. Um, what we can say 
is that at least over the last three to five uh, decades or so, there has been a slight uh, trend towards milder Decembers, less snowy Decembers in Chicago. Um, and that is just borne out of the observations here. Um, ultimately, weather patterns that we see on a day-to-day -day or a seasonal uh, basis um, are driven by things like the jet stream, El Nino, La Nina, um, and those are patterns that we call uh, natural variability. So they'll undergo um, systemic changes um, and oscillations over the course of decades or multiple decades there. Well, so maybe diminishing chances for white Christmases down the road, but that doesn't mean January, February, March uh, won't see uh, their share of snow. All right, Lee Carlaw, thanks very much. And up next, an update on student loan repayment. But first, a look at that upcoming forecast. Millions of student loan borrowers are getting another reprieve from making their federal loan payments. Last week, the Biden administration extended the federal student loan moratorium that was set to expire at the end of January. But some advocates are saying that's still not enough. Joining us to discuss what the loan freeze means for borrowers and the economy is Cody Hunanian, executive director at the Student Debt Crisis Center. Cody, welcome back. I think the last time you and I spoke, it was when the student loan moratorium was lifted. Now payments have paused again until the spring. Uh, how do you think the Omicron variant influenced the Biden administration's decision for this extension? Well, I think the variant is the number one factor that's influencing a lot of policies, including student loan payments. You know, at our organization, the Student Debt Crisis Center, we polled in November over 33,000 people, and we found that nine out of 10 of them said that they were not financially secure enough to resume payments in February. Between the end of November and beginning of December, we saw the variant really start to surge and the economic situation start to become less certain so i feel very strong that the depart or excuse me that the president and the department of education looked at this growing surge and thought this just cannot be the right time to resume payments now of course you know there are those who object to the idea of pausing student loan uh, repayments let alone canceling them um as i know you and some other advocates are calling for but they're making the case that this could hurt the economy and that borrowers will have to recuperate funds you know through taxes um and uh, other support that they receive so what is the economic impact here well, first, I would tell these naysayers, you know, talk to people that you know with student loan debt. I talk to student loan borrowers every day. Throughout this pandemic, they've been deeply concerned about supporting their families, putting, you know, shelter over their heads, putting food on the table. We're talking about some very serious financial obstacles that student loan, student loan borrowers are facing. I know it's we get lost in the macroeconomic discussion about the economy, but just think about the everyday impact that pausing student loan payments, that positive impact, it really means a lot. And oh, as far as we, oh, go ahead, please go ahead. Oh, as far as that that extra burden, you know, recent data from the Department of Ed showed that eighty-five billion dollars would be ripped out of the pockets of individuals and their families over the next year if payments were to resume that is going to have a domino effect on the economy as well. All of that said, though, you know, what is the likelihood, the political will, um, how likely is it that the president does decide to, to full out cancel student loan debt? Well, you know, the president promised uh, on the campaign trail to cancel at least $10,000 in student loan debt as part of his COVID-19 response. As I mentioned earlier, the, this administration is looking at this variant and this surge in cases and realizing that we are still deeply in a pandemic and responding to it. So I think there's still a great chance that this president will fulfill his promise. You know, the legal experts have shown and it's proven that the president has the legal authority to cancel student loan debt using the same powers he used to extend the pause on payments. So it's just a matter of the president putting pen to paper, signing an executive action, in canceling student loan debt. We're going to continue to fight because we feel very optimistic that we can make it happen. Now, on Wednesday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, she referenced the unemployment rate when uh, talking about student loan repayments. Let's watch. 
This is an issue both President Biden and Vice President Harris care deeply about. While the jobs recovery is one of the strongest on record, with nearly 6 million jobs added under President Biden, the fewest Americans filing for unemployment in more than 50 years, and overall unemployment down from 6 percent to 4.2 percent, we know some student loan borrowers are still coping with the pandemic and need some time before resuming payments. So, Cody, you know, Saki saying that unemployment is down in the U.S., but what has been uh, your experience with your organization in ter terms of borrowers who are also unemployed? Yeah, I mean, these unemployment numbers, it, it is great news. I'm happy to hear that the econ economy is starting to recover and that folks are back to work, but that doesn't paint the entire picture. Our organization in that survey I mentioned looked at the borrowers who are fully employed and still there, 89% are not financially ready to resume payments. So yes, people are back to work. People have found work to try to keep the roof over their head and food on the table. But we know that these borrowers have an enormous student loan debt burden. In fact, according to our research, a quarter of people's income will go to student loan payments for a chunk of these borrowers. So it's and a Cody, huge burden and it doesn't matter. Yeah, before we let you go, I wanted to mention that, you know, according to the Education Data Initiative, about 43 million borrowers each owe more than $39,000 in student debt. Uh, collectively, borrowers, though, they owe nearly $1.6 trillion. Um, you know, payments expected now to resume in May. Cody, we've got about 30 seconds, but what do borrowers need to do to prepare for when that day comes? Yeah, it sounds silly, but step one, make sure that your contact information is up to date at the Department of Education or with your student loan servicer. You will get a ton of important updates over the next month and over the next year. We want to make sure you get that information as soon as it's released. Okay. Cody Hunanian, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Up next, remembering a Lincoln Park Zoo legend. Stay with us. Longtime director of Lincoln Park Zoo, Dr. Lester Fisher, died last week at 100 years old. Fisher led a remarkable life from taking care of General Patton's bulldog during his service in World War II to a more than four decade association with Lincoln Park Zoo. Fisher became a familiar face to Chicagoans through his Ark in the Park segments on WGN with Ray Rayner. And during his tenure, Fisher transformed not just Lincoln Park Zoo, but the notion of what a zoo could be. Earlier this year, around Fisher's 100th birthday, Phil Ponce spoke with him about his incredible life and career. Phil asked him how he ended up taking care of General Patton's bulldog. When I went to England, my boss, Colonel Sperry, was, an, you might say, a friend of the generals. They'd been in the cavalry in Kansas together, and so when Patton got a puppy when he was in England before he crossed the continent and uh, the dog was part of his life and the colonel occasionally would call me up and say Fisher I'll be gone a few days when I'm away you take care of Willie and my answer always was yes sir and uh, I enjoyed that responsibility, but it also preyed on me because I thought if anything happens to that dog during my watch, the general's going to get rid of me. <laughs> well, I apparently, think a lot of people worry about, me, uh, about the German army, and I was worried about Willie. <laughs> Well, let's fast forward to your time at the Lincoln Park Zoo. You developed Pardon? a particularly strong relation uh, and affection for Bushman the gorilla. Remind us who Bushman was. Bushman was one of two big gorillas in America in those days. There was one at Ringling Brothers, and Bushman came to Chicago as a year-old youngster and grew up to be an incredible 550 pound beautiful muscled gorilla and uh, people in the city were fortunate to be able to come and watch and see him and uh, it was just an immense experience uh, to be close to an animal of that size and scope 
My understanding is that you would even dream about Bushman. Uh, what made him so special to you? Yes, I would. Yes, I would, because the dreams were the worrisome part. What'll happen if Bushman gets sick? How am I going to take care of him? What if ever I'm coming there to the old monkey house at night, two in the morning, and what if Bushman's standing out there somewhere waiting to see me? So those were the sort of dreams I had, and fortunately, I never had to worry too much about it, except one time the keeper goofed and didn't quite secure Bushman's cage properly. This was during the day, not at night. And uh, word came to my office, Bushman's out. And that, that was a very dramatic moment to me. And we found out that he had been played with through the back areas by the keepers with some snakes and so I said, go to the reptile house and get some garter snakes, and they did, and we showed them to Bushman under the doorway, and lo and behold, he walked back into his cage, and we secured it, and all was well. I was lucky. <laughs> well, you were lucky then, but uh, I understand that gorillas escaped from their enclosures four times. In fact, in 1985, when I was a reporter at uh, Channel 2, I covered the escape of a gorilla named Otto. How was it that gorillas were able to get out of their enclosures? Otto was uh, a very interesting animal because my parents were friends of Otto Kerner, who was then governor of Illinois. And so that's why I named that particular youngster at that time, Otto. And he got out, not from the inside building area, he was in an outside yard and he scaled the wall somehow. And they have pictures of me running toward him outside there and him running toward me. And we had kind of a standoff and again, by sheer good luck, we had the capture guns in those days where you could dart an animal with an anesthetic and we shot Otto with that and put him back in his cage. You were instrumental in re-envisioning what a zoo could be because my understanding is that when you first got there you came to think of the enclosures as jail cells for animals but you transformed it into uh, more of an open area, a little more naturalistic. Did you have for want of a better term, an aha moment when you decided things have got to change? Oh, my aha moment was the day I sat in my new office and thought a little about it. You have to remember that the zoos of 50 and 100 years ago were very sparse, and the reason was hygienic. It was easy to hose the cage out. So there was nothing in the cage except a shelf for the animal to sit on and for people to come and look when they were able to. And it just struck me that this was not the best thing to do with the animals. And so we decided that uh, one of our early goals would be to make life more meaningful for the animal and we decided to have less kinds of animals, less species, and we would give fewer animals more space. So that was kind of a goal, and we worked toward that. You became a regular on TV, as we mentioned, on WGN-TV. We just saw some still pictures of you uh, appearing on Channel 9, and let's take a look at a clip. David's brought Jeffrey, Jeffrey? one of the reptiles. Is this Jeffrey? Yes, this is Jeffrey. Doctor, this zoo is full of animals with first names. I can't believe it. Jeffrey? Well, what else would you call a handsome boy? I don't know. Like this. Charlie? <laughs> he's well, really a sweet animal, and of course, he's one of the handleable snakes. He's obviously. not venomous. Uh, he's a joy to have in a zoo because he helps give people an opportunity, especially in the city area, to become acquainted with snakes. Well, as you look back at uh, those experiences, as you look back at your life, I'm sure a lot of people have asked you, having just turned 100, is there a secret to longevity? Well, the only secret, and it's no real secret, is just good genes. Both of my parents lived to be in their 80s and 90s, 
and some good nutrition and a lot of good support uh, from my parents, from friends, from caregivers, from doctors. I think if you have the right mix of that and a little luck thrown in, you too may be able to do what I did, reach 100. And again, that was Phil Ponce with Dr. Lester Fisher, longtime director of Lincoln Park Zoo, who died last week at 100 years old. Well, from a studio on Western Avenue, an artist creates work that reflects both the beauty of nature and the grit of the city. And though he may be one of Chicago's most prominent artists, Tony Fitzpatrick grew up in Lombard. Now he's back in DuPage County for what he says will be his final museum show. Producer Mark Vitale recently met up with the artist in Humboldt Park. When you get here in the morning before there's a lot of folks, you just listen to the music of the birds, um, tree branches, the wind. You know, nature will heal you if you let it. The natural world and the urban environment share the stage in a museum exhibition that features all kinds of birds, real and imagined. I was really informed by, believe it or not, religious art when I was a kid. I grew up in a big Catholic family. I have five sisters, two brothers. And my father was in the funeral business, so, you know, they'd have mass cards, holy cards. There was something that densely atmospheric about these pictures that just kind of got to me. That and the comics, Dick Tracy, Little Orphan Annie. I started drawing at a really young age. The nuns used to tell my mother, you know, and uh, everything's going fine until he goes off in the Tony world. Well, I like Tony world. I was in charge there. His works are very layered collage pieces, and that layering contains a lot of different elements that replicates the layering you experience in the city. The different cultures overlapping, the sounds, uh, the snippets of poetry, of language. Oh, I like that. Look at that. A prolific artist, Tony Fitzpatrick works with a small team of assistants, often young artists themselves. His big break came in 1989 when he designed an album cover for the Neville Brothers. I wasn't trying to be found innocent, John. I was trying to be found guilty. Fitzpatrick is also an in-demand actor, from the series Patriot to playing the Chicago police chief in Spike Lee's Chirac. And he's a poet and playwright. You know, I'm kind of insatiably curious. I like to think that I learn from everything I look at. I didn't really go to art school, you know. I, I went to community college for a little bit. My education, you know, uh, came via the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary Art. I mean, people are like, well, you never went to school. It's like, I, I had the best teachers in the world. <laughs> His new show is called Jesus of Western Avenue. It's at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art on the campus of the College of DuPage. The late Cleve Carney was an arts advocate and an early collector of Fitzpatrick's work. Fitzpatrick has proclaimed this his final museum show. I think it's time for people who look like me to get out of the way and create some institutional wall space for people who've not had a light shine on them. There's over 90 works in this exhibition. At first he was like, oh, I'm going to do 60. Then it was 70, and then it was 80, and then he showed up with like 90 plus works. And most of it was made in the last three years. You only get one right around the fountain, and then it's into the ditch. There's a poem by Mary Oliver, what will you do with this one precious life you have? Well, I chose this. It's evolved over, you know, 45 years. I still enjoy doing this every day, you know. I still enjoy making art, you know, largely about Chicago. A lot of it about nature lately. I've become kind of an activist for bird life. My grandmother, who could not tell you a cardinal from a blue jay, every morning, though, she, she'd toast a couple pieces of bread, spread some jelly on it, chop it all up, and throw it out the back door to the birds. And I'm, I'm one of eight kids, you know, and uh, we never wasted food, you know? And I said, why are you giving all our bread to the birds? She goes, do me a favor, be quiet, give your ears a chance for once. She opens the window a little bit, and then I heard it, you know? I heard, you know, swallows and red-winged blackbirds and uh, morning doves and this, this, she said, you know, uh, birds were the first music the Irish ever had, you know, and she said, you know, if, if you're quiet and if you watch for a piece of bread, you can hear God sing. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale.
And the exhibition is at the Cleve Carney Museum of Art on the campus of the College of DuPage. It is free and open to the public, but you must register for a free ticket online. And watch an outtake of the interview in which Fitzpatrick recalls an encounter with his old friend, the late Studs Terkel. And we're back in a minute to wrap things up. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, WTTW.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. The latest on a surge in COVID cases in Chicago and across Illinois. And the amazing street photography of Vivian Meyer. A new book aims to answer questions about her mysterious life. And now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm which is proud to honor founder and senior partner Robert A. Clifford and partner Shannon McNulty for their award for excellence in pro bono and public interest service.